So um, today we're going to start talking about something here called uh, of the, the world. Um, the Bible talks a number of places about the difference between um, Jesus and his followers and this thing called the world. Um, have you ever experienced in your life so far um, ways that you all are um, raised differently from other children. Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> um, and, and so, so there is a sense within the Christian tradi tradition of um, in this battle or in this relationship between the church or, and the world, um, a sense of, of nonconformity, right? And nonconformity is you don't just go along with what the rest of the world is doing. You do what you feel called to do that is right, right? And so there is this, this constant, um, and it's mostly in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is talking in, in, in language that talks about the way the world is and the way the church is supposed to be. And um, can you think of anything like that that, that at your from your age and your perspective that you see that's different between what the church does and what the world outside of these walls does. Can you think of anything of this? <laughs> okay. So what could you be doing today instead of sitting here and looking at me with glassed over eyes? What could you be doing? You could have a phone, a real phone, right? There probably are some six-year-olds around there that have phones. We think that might be a difference. There's probably some eleven-year-olds that have phones, but you don't, right? Those, those are some of the we aspects have a of things. Kid phone. We have a kid phone, right? Yeah, that's kind of like the bag phone that I had in my car when I was whatever for emergencies, right? Um, you could be asleep. You could be laying in bed. This could be like another Saturday, although you guys got up and worked on the, the horse have farm yesterday. Oh, you have an old flip phone that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So, why do you think that, that there are those differences? Why Why do you think um, those those exist? Right. People make their own decisions. People make their own decisions, and that can that can be a good thing, but it also can mean that the decisions that people make might not be in line with the values that you have or that. that um, what do you think that it, that it, when you put it in the terms of the Bible saying it, there seems to be a, uh, a, a duality between what is right and what is wrong, right? And it, it would seem that the world has gone wrong and that the church is called to be right, and that can cause some trouble, right? There could be a sense that the world doesn't understand the church, there could be a sense that people trusting what the church is up to, whatever all those kinds of things are. And, and history has played that out for 2,000 years. So that, that how does the church work inside the world but not become like the world? And, and is the church's job to work to try to transform and change the world so the world is kind of like churches? And how does that balance between the two kind of fit? Um, and you all have already experienced that as kids. I mean, you all have differences that are going on with you all that are different from other, other kids. Right? So let's, let's pray to God. Dear God, thank you for giving us these choices and giving us these differences. Help us to find what our place is in the world, to serve you, and to listen to what you would have us do at all times as we grow. And bless parents and children as we make some hard decisions through their lives.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be drawn into it. Help us to hear it. Help us to hear it anew. Help us to think in terms of what you would have us do rather than where we feel um, we are. In all things, let us come prayerfully to you and ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as, as I was after this marathon through Mark, I was um, thinking about what I wanted to preach next and, um, and had, had kind of thought that there was a major um, question going on in the world today about what is the role of the church and what is the role of the world and how do they relate to each other. And I was like, well, that, that'll fit for next week, um, for this week, and I will be on that and then I'll have to think of something else. And then as I started going into it, I realized um, there's an easy way to do that where, where you don't ask a lot of questions and you just start pointing fingers at the world and how crazy it has gotten. And then there is another way that is more responsible and more um, humble in the face of everything that's going on. And I thought that that second way might be better. Now, I want to give you a little bit of insight into how I got to this place um, I wanted to, I was drawn to 2 Corinthians, and I think the reason I was drawn to it is, is when we were going through Paul's letters in Bible study on Tuesdays back, back when, we were, we were really interested and had some really good discussions from 2 Corinthians that um, didn't necessarily happen before. You know, um, there was so much there. And there was so much there that was kind of fresh because uh, the first Corinthians is, is, is talked about a lot. Second Corinthians is kind of left and, and forgotten. Um, you know, in first Corinthians, you have all of those really famous parts. The, uh, Paul's dance describing love, right? Love is patient and love is kind. It, it really is a dance through uh, that idea. And, and, and 1 Corinthians is also central because one of the major problems that faces the church throughout the centuries is what faced that church, and that is that of division and internal uh, friction. And, and any time that you're dealing with people and working together, these kinds of issues come up. And so 1 Corinthians is often used in that way. Um. But maybe the, that memorableness, I don't think that's a word, but I'll use it, the memorableness of 1 Corinthians causes that second volume to be overshadowed in our knowledge of the Bible. And so that when we return to it, we find it fresh and new and engaging in a way that we are missing. And the, the same was true um, when I went in this week, um, but truly... One thing in this passage caught my eye and it connected to this world um, question that I also had going on. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, light, light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now it's so casual how Paul drops this in. And, and I think that's how it captured me. It's very casual. It's like, light. And it's interesting because it's the only time that this phrase is ever used anywhere else in the Bible. Um, 
Those who are perishing, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the believers. God of this world. And what it does is it blinds the minds of the believers. This is the only time that that phrase, God of this world, is ever used. And Paul drops it so, so casually as if we would all know exactly who he's talking about. And maybe we do. Maybe we do know who the God of this world is. Um, but jumping to that conclusion um, may be a little bit too easy. Um, we see in this, though, reflected one of the great themes of the New Testament. And that is the church or the individual Christian versus the world. Um, and that the world is not simply a matter of geography, but the adversarial counterpart to the fledgling church. Do we still find the world to be the main, would we say, enemy? Is that fair? To call the world the enemy? Is adversary better? What about rival? The church and the world, that relationship. The passage is only used that one time about the God of this world, but it is used so many other times without the God of this world there. Um, so what does it mean, the God of this world, right? What is that? Why is it only used here? And are we to take it for granted that it's talking about the devil, Satan? You see, this one passage, this one thing, is, it's flowing with question after question after question. What exactly are we getting at when we say the church versus the world? I wanted to start this morning a new series of sermons that deal with this very dichotomy, the church and the world. I want during the course of this to think about what the world is. And what the church's position is in relationship with the world. What are we to do about the world? Is the world a god? Is the world in the hands of a god? Are the people of the world blinded by the world and its god? What does this mean about God himself? Does the world have a God ruling it that is not the God that we worship? Where did this God come from? You see, this personifying of this dichotomy is interesting when you call it God, when you give it a divinity, even if that divinity is probably in some sense pagan in its framework. And maybe this God of the world is only one aspect of it because it's only mentioned here. What is our relationship to the world? Are we to escape the world? That the world is this horrible place and that we are just here dealing with the problems until we can escape it. That's what the Gnostics believed. Of course, they were thrown out almost 2,000 years ago as a heresy. Are we to serve the world? Surely we have a role in that. But when do we know that we have taken it too far? When do we know that we have overstepped our mission and replaced it with our own biases? What happens when we create unintended consequences? We've seen that throughout history as well. Are we to save the world? Or do we leave such things up to Christ? Are we to live in it, but not be of it? In other words, just bide our time as weary travelers, sojourners waiting for what comes next. 
This has been thought throughout Christian history as well. If you think about the 1800s and the Shakers, right? They never had children. They didn't. They were celibate. The, the thoughts that they would try to perpetuate themselves in the world was not what that religion was about. And they called themselves Christian as well. Are we sent into the world for some mission? Do we spread this idea of Christian culture? And what does that mean? And how do you do it? Are we saved from the world for something else entirely? Does Jesus come in and scoop us up and take us out of the world? Surely we've come across these questions again and again, and, and, and all sides of them have been discussed. What is the church's role in politics? If you've ever had that knock at your door when Jehovah's Witnesses come in, that's one of their chief tenets. There is no role of the church in politics. You should completely separate yourself. These writings, every writing in the Bible about this difference between the church and the world were all written when Christians were a persecuted minority sect within the larger contents of the, uh, context of the Roman Empire. Does it change? Does the relationship between the church and the world change when the world becomes Christianized? Or has the world influenced Christendom during that battle. As Christendom conquered the world, did the world truly change what it meant to be Christian in the beginning? And where does that lead us today as we fight these inane culture world wars that only give the politicians themselves more power? as they keep us divided? These are all important questions here, and I'm not sure how many weeks we're gonna linger on this, but I think we could spend some time. Um, but at least two, because I know that this one is not about conclusions, but about posing questions and looking to the Bible for where those questions might be cultivated. So this one isn't an answer but a beginning, and, and so there must be another one. I want to take some time to do some homework because it's so easy to be another railing voice against the world when you miss how much of the world has come into and created that railing voice. That it's important for us to go back to Scripture, to back to the places in the Bible where this idea is brought up, and make sure that we are in line with what's being talked about there. So today, what does the Bible say about the relationship of the church and Christians and the world? Because what if the truth is that we ourselves and our brothers and sisters in Christ have become blinded by the God of this world already. What if the truth is that that is the case? And if so, Scripture would be the place that we would go to regain our sight, to find enough light to regain our sight. So if you do a search on Bible Gateway or whatever biblical engine you might use, you will find a treasure trove of information when you just put in quotes, the world. In every place that the world is brought up. For instance, John, the gospel writer and the epistle writer John, really, really, really liked this idea of talking about the world as something different from The church or from the followers of Jesus, the message. Because he references the world 50 times in the Gospel of John. The other Gospel writers, Matthew only does it nine, 
Luke does it five, and Mark does it twice. And most of the time in the other Gospels, you see the world just as a geographic place, not as an adversarial collection of all that is that is against Jesus. In John, though, you see it. In John's first letter that he's attributed, that short volume, only 15 or should I say, oh my goodness, 15. 15 times in five short chapters. So you can see how much that John is focused on this phrase, the world and the other gospels kind of aren't as much. And it's even more telling because I found different categories, one of which doesn't really have anything to do with our interest um, because it, it's again that geographical, geographic location. Um, and then the other that's about this figurative understanding of the world as the adversary. Um, so the, uh, it's interesting to make this distinction. So look, look, look at this. This is John 1, 9 through 10. This is a good example of this difference. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. In that one, two verse passage, you have both of the ideas. Jesus coming into the world, as, as in the geographic location of the world. And then the world not recognizing him, which suggests the other usage of the term, the world. You have them both. Here's another where John does the same thing. I came from the Father and have come into the world... <laughs> Again, I am leaving the world and I'm going to the Father. That seems like geographic. This is John 16, 28. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage because I have conquered the world. Interesting thing going on. So we have world as a geographic place, world as an adversary, and world as defeated and conquered by Jesus. How do those all fit together? Isn't it interesting that they're all there, geographic coming and going, but then it seems to hinge upon the other. When it says, in the world there is persecution, but then also I have conquered that persecution. There are many of them that are just geographic, I tried to mostly ignore them, but, I, but in Luke and Acts, there's so many times where, where you know, it happens where he's talking about the foundations of the world or world as a geographic place. Ma Matthew has two, which kind of get close to jumping into symbolic. Listen to this. This is Matthew 5.14. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Right? That seems to be talking about geographic but it's also talking about the mission that we might have against or in or to save the world. That's echoed in Philippians 2.15. So that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. Matthew 13.22 gets into, this is in a parable. As for what was sown among thorns, this is one who hears the world, word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the world and it yields nothing. Familiar with that, right? Here the world is seen as a geographic place, but it's also something that lures us away from the truth. So you see, um, even though Matthew doesn't put as much influence on it, it's still kind of there. The cares of the world versus the light of the world. This does paint kind of the picture about the adversarial relationship, but it's only slight. It's really John that gives us that full picture. So let's look back at John. John 8, 12. Jesus, the light of the world. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 14, 19. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. 
John's created an interesting creation, a connection between the world and the church and the Christian. Because in one way, Jesus has conquered the world, but in the other sense, the same world is lingering with some kind of danger to Christians. And it's seeming to happen all at the same time, with all one gospel writer writing both sides of it. And we experience that in our lives, right? There is a sense that both we feel safe, we feel that things are in God's hands, that we feel all that we are good, but in the other sense, we're like, whoa. Things seem to be at the same time spiraling out of control, and there's things that we don't get, and, and, and it's confusing. All at once. Of course, we see familiar passages like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. God loving the world. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 6, the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 12, 47, I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. In the next line, in the next lines, we're going to see the dividing lines being drawn, though, in John. John 14, 27, peace I leave you. The peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So there is a sense that the church, that God, that Jesus offers us a different kind of peace that the world cannot ever give. Is that the beginning of that adversarial relationship? Here the differences get more intense. John 15, 18, and 19. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Here we start to get the idea of being in, but not of the world, right? The world hates, the world persecutes. If you're in with the world, everything's cool, but the minute that you step outside of that, boom, the hammer falls. You see that today. There's at least two or three at perfect examples of that just this week, where as the moment that someone spoke out against the world's narrative, the hammer came down on them very hard from the world's minion. This we are, in John 17, we have Jesus praying for his people. He says, as I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. So I'm not taking them out of the world. I'm leaving them there for some purpose, but I ask you also to protect them from evil. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through the word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. In the world as beacons of light and to the truth of saying this is what God has done. That the world might know the truth through the people that have believed. The connection between Jesus and his people. Is that what we get into when we talk about the difference between the church or the Christian and the world? The fact that they are connected in, to God and to Jesus. We can see how G John paints this picture. There's a difference between the world and the followers of Jesus. There is a persecution aspect also. That the world is not just there as something to be 
ignored, but that the world comes at the Christian or comes at the followers of Jesus as with persecution. It seems as if the world might be defined this simply, that the world are those who have rejected Jesus and that they will also reject Jesus' followers. So we jump out of John for a little bit and jump into Romans. Paul doesn't talk about the world quite as much and quite exactly in the same way that John does, but he does talk about it. He says, Romans 12, 2, every other place in Romans that the world is mentioned, it's talking about the geographical place. But this one place, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So there's a sense that there are the world is teaching you one thing and that God is availing you with information about something else. Is it possible for you to ignore the one and train your mind on the other? I think that goes along with John, but it kind of puts it in a little bit of a different context. In Paul, and also in Paul, in 1 Corinthians, you hear this. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Again, there's a sense that the way that the world does things is <coughs> made foolish by God and its truth. They may seem and think of themselves as wise, but in truth, they are not at all connected. In Galatians, Paul says this, So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. You mean the pagan gods. Galatians 6, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Colossians 2.20 If Christ you died to the if, in, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to its regulations? Again, there's that countercultural thing. The world is telling you, you must do this and Paul is relieving you of whatever that yoke is. James that epistle of straw that Martin Luther so loved to rel against. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Keeps building upon this sense that there is a major difference between what is the world and what is God. And it's important for us, I think, in this day and time, where it seems so clear how crazy the world has become, that we take stock of where we should be in relation to that world, and take a step back, possibly, look at ourselves, and make sure that we are aligned with the scripture and not just less bad than the world. We hear in politics all the time, oh, well, we get the lesser of two evils up there. <laughs> then maybe we should not be in the mode of taking the lesser of two evils, but instead connecting ourselves to the truth and seeing where that leaves us in relationship with the world. John comes back to it in his letters. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. Another place he says, Little children, you are from God and you have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. John 5, 3 to 5, For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. 
Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Commandments, victory, and faith. Over the next week, at least, I want to look at what it is that that means to us. And what that in itself, the idea of faith in itself, is different from the way that the world operates. That we're going to cut through the spectacle and try to find what's at the root of the difference. Because it's easy, you can turn on the TV and see the difference, but it's harder to see behind that, the root of the difference. That's what I want us to see in these next few weeks. What is the root of the difference? And how can we reclaim and hold on to what is true and valuable in the face of all of it? Because that is, I think, the beginning of the way that, the, as John puts it, the victory will come. And nothing else will give us that victory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in difficult times. Before we look at others to take the plank out of their eye, we must start to look at the speck in our own first. May we do that. May we look at how the world has infiltrated the way that we operate. May we also look not to beat ourselves up, but that we might reconnect with truth so that we can truly engage and lay claim to the victory over the world that is promised. May we not be just of the world not just in the world and not only of the world but in the world with a mission to witness to shine a light so that God's truth will be known by all the promises have been made may we see them come to come to be in their totality Along the way, may we learn how to better care for each other. How to figure out how it is that we can help. How it is that we can pray. How it is that we can make a difference in the lives of others. Both within these walls and without. We thank you for the amazing efforts that are happening in this church. From its people to help those in need. Again and again, these may they be visits or phone calls or cards or, or, or work and help and hands-on things that are going on. The mission of this church is being done every day in a thousand, countless ways, million countless ways. Because here, what we are trying to do is build up people who care people who love and be people who serve and support them in every way that is possible be with those that are sick be with those who are mourning be with those who are serving to the city their loved ones their care the help helpers the caregivers give them peace and a sense of purpose let them know how much what they do matters. And let them know that in, a, in the face of a world that says many things, your truth rings out clearly that faith is the answer. And we ask all of these things. The perfecter of that faith, Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name.
This um, hymn, it is not 604. If you look over to the left, the, you can see the words, How Can I Keep From Singing? Um, I, I told Charlene that, that I would do this one guitar, but then I realized my guitar's not here. So we're going to do it, gonna do it um, a cappella. I'm, I'm going to leave. This is actually a good way that this song would be done, because this is one of those that has, if you can imagine a bagpipe drone.